particles like these so fast and cool. Bombs out of mechanics and pipe up some cold words But no one can deny the fact that on the theory works there's a couple of things I want to touch on when it comes to this video. First of all, I want to talk about band structures, what band structures are. And I also need to talk about what resistance is when it comes to your insulators, conductors, and semiconductors. Before I start, I quickly want to cover again what I talked about in the last video, is that when you have, usually when you have any atom that is by itself, every single shell has a defined energy level. Whereas if they come together, we have a tangling between shells, and that changes the actual energy levels of the first shell, the sort of lens shell. So in this case, for example, let's say here we have every single electron might have, let's say, three joules of energy in that lens shell, which is the outermost shell. And that will change once we bring all the atoms close together, which is the case in a normal lattice. Right? So now we bring just these different types of atoms, which are all silicon atoms, bring all these silicon atoms together. And that means we have a sort of tangling of of a tangling of shells. Shells are sort of on top of each other. And that means there's going to be a disturbance in terms of normal levels of energy. All right, so usually you might say that each of these has an exact amount of energy. But now because they've overlapped, each valence electron will have often a different amount of energy. Right, so here we have our valence electrons. I can quickly sort of call them in red. These were the ones here. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And there's a couple more. Oops. But as you can tell, some of them will be closer to your positive center. So these ones will be a bit closer. This one will be quite close. This one will have a bit less energy. Whereas this one is further away from your positive nuclei, which means it's going to have more energy. So beforehand, they all had the same. Now they have different amounts of energy. So even your valence band, valence electrons will have different amounts of energy. And that's important because that's why we talk about band structures. Because what a band structure is, it's just showing you what kind of energy levels different types of electrons have. So here we, for example, we have usually what's in a band structure, what you actually include. You, you include your valence band. So this has all of your electrons, which are in your valence shell, originally in your valence shell. We have your conduction band. These are your electrons which you can find in your conduction shell. We have the forbidden energy gap. Remember, that was the energy gap that we had to climb. So you had to have that much energy to get from the valence band into the conduction band. So this is the amount of energy required. And the idea is that, for example, for a semiconductor, you're going to find most of its electrons will be in the valence band. So this is the valence band. Most of them will be here. But the ones which are, for example, the furthest away from the nuclei, the ones which have the most energy, so these are, this one would be, for example, has the most energy. This one might actually have enough energy to jump from the valence band into the conduction band. So it was here originally, top of the range, so right, this is energy here. So if you look at the, the energy going increasing as we go up, so the middle here would be the middle energy levels for the valence band. You're going to have the ones which are lower are going to have less energy. Than the, the average, and you're going to have the ones which are above it are going to have more energy than the average. Now, overall, for a semiconductor, for example, the average valence energy is not enough to get them into the conduction band, but the average means there's going to be some below, some, some above. And for example, some of these here, some of these energy, these electrons might get a bit more energy and then jump from this point into the conduction band and then become a conduction band electron which means it will conduct electricity a lot better than if it were in a lens band. And the amount of energy it has to be overcome to get to that point, we call the forbidden energy gap. Now, we also need to talk about resistance. Resistance was just the idea that if you have high resistance, that means you're not a good conductor. If you have low resistance, that means you're a very good conductor. And there's two main things we need to talk about when it comes to what causes resistance, and that's your energy gap. So the bigger the energy gap, the more resistance the actual material will have. Right? So in this case, this might be a pretty big gap. That means it has high resistance. If that gap is small, that means low resistance. And also the number of collisions. And that, what I'm talking about here is number of collisions with the electrons. For example, if this electron here were to often collide 
with the nuclei, the, the positive nuclei, that would mean it would increase the resistance, right? So either collision with, with different electrons or different positive charge nuclei or a high energy gap. These two lead to increased resistance. And we're going to cover that more in detail in a second. The reason why I mention all this is because dot point itself says describe the difference between conductors, insulators, and semiconductors in terms of band structure and relative resistance. Right? Band structure was what we just talked about. And relative resistance was just if it's high resistance, that means it's, it won't let um, electricity flow easily. Low, high, uh, low resistance means it allows actual electricity to flow quite easily. Right? So we need to talk about the difference between conductors, insulators, and semiconductors in terms of band structure and relative resistance. I'll start with the actual conductors. Conductors are generally your metals, right? So most of your metals are con good conductors. And if, for example, we bring metals close together, right? So here we have them by themselves, all of these atoms. Now we bring them close together. What will actually happen is all of their valence electrons will jump and become conductor electrons, so conduction electrons. So here we have each and every one of those electrons will gain enough energy. Right? So I'm going to change the color from these ones, which used to be valence electrons. I'll change them to pinkish, which means they're conduction electrons. So what that means is they can travel. They're, they're not bound anymore. They have enough energy to just travel to random places. They're going to be going back and forth and all over the place. right? So these are conduction electrons because they've gained enough energy when it comes to moving away from their close proximity and they're free to move. Right? So these are they're called delocalized electrons. If you're localized, that means I always know your location, right? So localized would mean I always know your location. Delocalized means your location is not defined. You keep moving. And conductors, all the electrons are delocalized, which means they're all in the conduction band. And so how would the band structure for a conductor look like? It would look like something like this. We actually have your valence band and your conduction band being one the same. They're both the same. Your forbidden energy gap doesn't exist. There's no forbidden energy gap. They all have moved into the conduct conduction band, right? So all the electrons are found in the conduction band. So all electrons for your conductors are here, which more or less means that, I mean, you could just draw it by having just pure conduction electrons. So every single energy level of a metal, all the electrons are in the conduction band. We don't have any forbidden energy gap. Uh, and the valence band and conduction band are basically identical, right? So if we talk about valence electrons or conduction electrons in the conductor, they're the same thing because all electrons can move freely as they wish in the conductor. A semiconductor, it's a bit, a bit different. So the two main examples we often hear is silicon, so SI for silicon, or germanium, GE for germanium. Now what happens if we bring them closer together? So with a silicon, for example, Gonna have, what you're going to find is the energy gap is, exists. There is an energy gap for silicon. It's not as big as for insulators, but it, it does exist. So what that means is you're going to have most of your actual electrons will be in the valence band, so in the lower band. So most will be here. But we call this shell partially filled. Right? So the valence band is partially filled, which means it's almost full, but not f quite full. Beforehand, before they moved together, before they came close together, they were, it was full. All the electrons were in a lens band. Now it's partially filled. And the reason why is because some of these actual electrons, let's say the one which was furthest away from the positive nuclei, let's say this one here, this one had enough energy and it would have gone and turned into a conduction electron. So for the semiconductors, what you're going to see is you're going to see your actual lens band being quite full. You're going to see a pretty small energy gap this one here, but it's going to exist, it's going to be an energy gap, and you're going to see some of the electrons being in the conduction band, because some of them will have enough energy to jump from the valence band into the conduction band. Right? So this is your band structure for your semiconductors. And for your insulators, an example here would be, for example, rubber or wood. The insulators, I'm just drawing here, this is just um, a carb hydrocarbon. Right? So hydrocarbons is often your backbone, for, for example, for polymers of plastic or for rubber. And when this comes together, you have all the electrons being locked in, right? They're strong covalent bonds. They're just completely locked in and they're not going to be moving much, which means for an insulator, 
you're going to have a huge energy gap, right? So how much energy I need to have to be able to go away, break that bond, that covalent bond, will be quite big. So overall, it's quite unrealistic to find many of your electrons in the conduction band for an insulator. An example would be your rubber, your rubber, your plastic, and your wood. It's still possible for them to actually be conducting, but it's very unlikely. And the band structure looks something like this. You've got your valence band, which is more or less full on the bottom. So all the electrons are in the valence band. The energy gap is quite big, so it's going to be quite a bit bigger than for the actual semiconductors. And we're going to find basically no non at room temperature. This is all, all that I just mentioned was all at room temperature. At room temperature. So at room temperature, there's going to be none at all in the conduction band. Right? So conduction band, there'll be none at all because they've all they're bound to their actual different atoms and they're not moving at all. Right? So this is the actual band structure for insulators. We still have to talk about the relative resistance. Well, for the conductors, relative resistance at room temperature is more or less none. So it has no resistance or very little. It does have some resistance, but very little resistance. So little resistance because we have these electrons have moved in the conduction band and they're just moving moving about as they wish. They're not being held by any bonds. They're just moving around. The semiconductor will have sort of your medium level of resistance because here we have some who have moved from the electrons uh, from the valence band into the conduction band. These will have experienced low resistance, but the other ones are still stuck with the actual other silicon electrons, these ones here, they'll experience higher amounts of resistance. But overall, it's it's in between conductors and insulators. Insulators, on the other hand, have high resistance because these guys are bound, the electrons are bound to their actual atoms. They're not moving much at all. And for them to be able to conduct electricity, they would have to invest lots of energy. But we said that two things, so in the energy gap and a number of collisions, both of these determine resistance. So what would happen, for example, if we increased the temperature, so increase the temperature for your semiconductors, what would happen? Well, that means that on average, these electrons, if we increase temperature, that means we give them more thermal energy. So thermal energy. So these electrons will have more energy than they did beforehand. And what that actually means is that we're going to see some of these electrons, more of these electrons, jumping from the actual valence band into the conduction band. So by increasing temperature, we're going to produce more conduction band electrons for semiconductors. And that means we decrease resistance. So for a semiconductor, if we increase temperature, that means we decrease resistance. For an insulator, if we increase temperature, same thing would happen. But often what the problem is we have to increase temperature so much for them to actually jump. That, for example, if we, if we have a plastic and we put really high temperatures, what happens to the plastic? It's going to melt. Right, so even though we can bring them, for example, from a valence band level to conduction band level by simply increasing temperature, what that means is that we have a problem because the actual structure will be gone. So increasing temperature does decrease resistance, but often also destroys the actual structure of an insulator, which makes it pointless. So temperature is best to increase for semiconductors to increase the actual con connectivity and decrease the resistance. Now, what happens with conductors? Well, this is quite interesting because one of the reasons why we would increase temperature would be to bring some of the actual conduction valence band electrons into the conduction band. But as we said earlier, the conductors, all of the actual electrons are already in the conduction band. So what would be the point of increasing temperature? So increasing temperature, in this case, actually doesn't make it a better conductor. It actually increases resistance. And the reason why is because two things happen when we increase the temperature. We make some of them move from the valence band into the conduction band, which doesn't matter for atoms because they're already all in the conduction band anyway. But we also increase the number of collisions. Right, so by making them move faster, we're going to have some of more of them move, hitting some of the actual nuclei. Some more of them will hit the nuclei because they're moving faster because of more energy. So that actually makes increased resistance. So in this case, conductor, none, none of them will jump from the valence band into conduction band, but more of them will collide. So the number of collisions increases as we increase temperature. So overall, by increasing temperature, we actually increase resistance for conductors.
Whereas for semiconductors, by increasing temperature, we decrease resistance because more of them will move from the lens band into conduction band. And I'll quickly go over again what you need to know for stop point. Describe the difference between conductors, insulators, and semiconductors in terms of band structure and relative resistance. So what you need to know is you need to know these different types of band structures. So for example, that the conductors have just one more or less one block of, of band structure. We don't have any energy gap. The conduction the electrons are also the valence electrons. So it's more or less all being just one. Whereas for semiconductors, we have your valence band at room temperature being partially filled, where some of the ones will have enough energy to move from the valence band into conduction band, but most of them will still be in the valence band. The insulators, we're going to have a pretty big energy gap, which means most will be in your valence band. It's going to be basically full at room temperature, and your conduction band is going to be empty, empty because they wouldn't have enough energy to get there. And we should also know what happens when it comes to resistance. So usually conductors have low resistance, semiconductors kind of in between conductors and insulators. Insulators have high resistance. And by changing temperature, we can affect the resistance. So for example, by increasing temperature for conductors, we increase resistance. Whereas for semiconductors, by increasing temperature, we decrease resistance. And same goes for insulators as well. By increasing temperatures to a really high level for insulators, we decrease resistance as well. But hopefully that was useful. Thank you for watching.